What am I doing? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do I need to do the intro? <laughs> no, I, I got it. Okay, you I'm can do it. I can do it. I got it. Okay, you go for it. <laughs> Here we go. I think it's rock bottom for baseball again. At least I hope that it is, because if things get worse than this, then there might be some more existential questions to ask. Plus, we've got hoops in full offseason swing, unless you're UConn and Purdue, and it's spring football season. We've got some updates for you there. All of that and more on this episode of Frogs Insider, which starts right now. Welcome in to another episode of Frogs Insider, episode number 60, Melissa. Oh, wow. Milestone time. Cruising. Cruising yeah. uh, through these episodes. Number 60 here at Frogs Insider, part of the Dave Campbell's Texas Football Republic of Football Network. You can find our show wherever you just found our show, if you're listening to it, which means you're either on your favorite podcast streaming service or you're on the YouTube channel. Appreciate you either way. Go ahead and leave us a rating and a review. Leave a comment under the video if you'd be so kind. We appreciate all of the support. Brought to you by our lovely sponsors, Homefield Apparel and Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods. Thankful for both of them as well. We're going to talk more about them later on in the show. But Melissa, I want to, off the top, talk about uh, college hoops a little bit because mm -hmm. we've been pretty actively discussing hoops in the group chat the last couple of weeks, yes. not only because of March Madness happening, but because of the absolutely banana sandwich coaching cycle that yeah. we are living through right now that all started because uh, USC's head coach decided to go to SMU. Mm -hmm. And also, from banana there, sandwich? I, I got lost in lost in my in my phrase phraseology. I, there. I like it. I'm here for it. I think it fits. I just, I just pulled up at the last minute. That's that one's on me. I'll do. I promise to do better next time. Uh, yeah, I pulled up. I pulled a Caitlin Clark from the logo, but unlike Caitlin Clark, I fully bricked and <laughs> Fair. missed yeah, the shot. It's good. It's good. Um, I'm here for it. So, anyways, John Calipari leaving Kentucky to go to Arkansas. It, Musk going from Arkansas to USC. We've got. Uh, I mean, it's been crazy. Yeah. We've we've seen two coaches, Chris Beard and Jerome Tang, publicly use the Arkansas job to get extensions. Mm -hmm. Let's start here, actually, Melissa, now that I've mentioned Jerome Tang and I've reminded myself of this. Part of his extension agreement to stay at Kansas State means that there is now a clause, not just for basketball, but for all sports, that prohibits the university president from, quote unquote, interfering in student athlete code of conduct issues oh really mm -hmm. do you remember what happened at kansas state earlier this i do year? remember what happened at kansas state earlier this year and i remember what an ordeal it was uh that is that <laughs> is going to have quite the trickle down effect in college athletics i think it's gonna have quite the trickle down effect at kansas state also that Oh, hey, you're just saying that the coaches and the AD now have all of the the power and the say to enforce the code of conduct for student athletes? Where have Which we seen things like that go wrong of, before? Is this like Roger Goodell being uh, the judge, jury, and executioner for the NFL for a couple of years before <laughs> that change? Yeah, this this feels like it's moving us once again towards athletics operating as separate entities from actual universities and sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. I think it's probably ultimately a bad idea not to say that the athletics department at Kansas state don't have, you know, upstanding morals and values and integrity and all those things. But at the end of the day, your athletics department exists because of your university and your university has likely been influenced by your athletics department. We've certainly seen that at TCU, but that's giving a little bit too much power to a department that has a vested interest in looking the other way occasionally in such circumstances. Yeah, I, it will be interesting to see how it bears out in practice versus in theory, but it's pretty clear even in theory to see some significant ways that it could backfire and go pretty, pretty poorly. Um, like you said, you hope that people operate with integrity. You hope that people operate from a place of good standing and just good ethics. Mm -hmm. In practice, uh, that doesn't always happen. Not saying it will happen at Kansas State. I'm just saying it doesn't always happen. Interesting, interesting though, that that is something that apparently rubbed Tang so 
but like the wrong way so badly that that was something he tried to get into um, writing at Kansas State. Which also, as much as I want to think highly of Jerome Tang, I don't like that that was such a priority to him because of one instance. That's kind of, yeah. you know, putting putting the cart before the horse a little bit, I think, because he didn't like the way one thing went. And now he's going to potentially open up a can of worms that could greatly impact the university as a whole um, in a negative. There's there's really nothing like extra positive they gain from this. The only thing that we will ever know about will be if something bad happens. True. That's true. And that's it's almost like an offensive lineman. You never talk about an <laughs> offensive lineman when they're doing great. You only mm -hmm. talk about offensive linemen when they've missed a, a key block. Uh, I will say, if you talk to Kansas State folks about it, they're all okay with it because there apparently has been a history of meddling by the university president that has gone above and beyond what's been reasonable and necessary. Mm -hmm. I can understand a fan's frustration, I think, sure. if there was some nosy leadership. Not like in a, oh my gosh, I'm going to yeah. find these bad people and get them out of the program kind of way, but just a hey, I'm going to make the process a lot harder for other people to do their jobs kind of way. Like that, I can see being a frustrating situation. Daniel but... Pullen and Bebo would never, would never. TC's got great leadership. That's all I'm going to say about that. TC's got yeah. fantastic leadership. Top yeah. to bottom. Agreed. Uh, it, <clears> is, <throat> it is very fascinating, kind of going back to the coaching carousel, that – all of these pieces that move that if you are a casual observer of college basketball, you're thinking, man, these are some big names from big blue blood programs kind of swapping around here. And it all hinged. And Roger Sherman had a great tweet about how, you know, this all hinged because USC's coach left for SMU and it, it, the dominoes that fell from there. But I think you also, if you, if you pay attention to the sport and you're a more in-depth fan, you realize these are all guys who had basically worn out their welcome at their current place and are getting out while the getting out was good. And, and Coach Cal especially, I mean, for Kentucky would have probably gotten rid of him, and certainly the fan base was over it. Because I think he's got – hasn't made a Final Four in 10 basketball seasons, um, has one win, no more than one win in the SEC tournament or the NCAA tournament in any of the last four seasons. Um, haven't won an SEC championship um, in several years. And, you know, still sending guys to the NBA. His players are still incredibly successful in the NBA. I, I cheer for a team that has three of them that are three of the <laughs> better players in the league. Um, but uh, it hadn't, hadn't won. And Cal's never really cared about winning, except when they did yeah. win. Mm -hmm. Um but he's cared about getting guys to the league. And I think with a genuine, like, actually, like, I want you to have generational wealth kind of a meaning, um, it, at it, probably his own coaching record success. But, um, it, you know, I, it, it's not, there is a coup absolutely for Arkansas and, and the Tyson chicken empire to have gotten him. But I don't think there's a whole lot of tears being shed in, in Lexington today either. Um, you know, Andy Enfield was going to be gone if he didn't choose to leave. And Musk, uh, Arkansas fans were frustrated with, with him and their lack of success, um, you know, recent, very recently. I mean, they've been a pretty good program. He's won a lot of games there. They made the Final Four like two years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they were doing all right. But when your football team is it struggles mm -hmm. and you're yeah it's 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 okay to maybe put a little bit more emphasis in in basketball season I guess. Razorbacks, just hang your hat on that number one baseball team that you got. Yeah, yeah. Just the only that. just the hang only your hat on Hagen preseason, Smith. the only preseason highly touted team that seems to have lived up to the uh, to the billing or one of the few because we certainly yes. haven't experienced that. But we'll get to that a little bit later. We yeah, will get to that a little bit it's, later. It's fascinating. Um, I want to know who's going to call Don Staley first. Um, I, I mean, I you. I was I was kind of pondering this, and I know there's going to be a lot of pushback and a lot of people that disagree with me, but I don't know if there is a coach that any college basketball fan would want now. If you had no coach, like she she's I mean, who has done more in the last three years than Don Staley? Who has been better? Who has like not only recruited at a high level but gotten her kids to play together? She recruits almost like Calipari, but her teams win. And they win with unselfish play and they still go to the league and have success there as well. Um, it, it was, I, I will say again, you know, someone who's loves the big game basketball that's been coaching um, girls basketball for almost 30 years uh, watching Jeez. this. I know I'm so old. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> I was walking the dogs earlier today and I walked by this girl and her dad's like trying to coach her up and you could see she's like rolling her eyes and she's so frustrated. And I was like, 
keep that guide hand up longer. Hold your follow through. You got this. Don't worry. And she looked at me. She was like, it was so funny. It was really cute. Uh, her dad was like, yeah, listen to her. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, to see the interest, the authentic interest around the sport for the last couple of weeks, really this whole last season, to see that game last night, which was unbelievable. Um, mm-hmm. Rack up almost 19 million views, most watched game, men's or women's, I think, in the last five years. Um, it's been really cool to see that sport grow. And Don Staley, what an incredible ambassador not just for women's college basketball, but college basketball in general. Um, just the way she handled the Caitlin Clark situation, how gracious she was, how much credit she was willing to give her, the way she handles her players, the genuine show of emotion. Um, just as someone who loves the game and loves the sport and loves the sport of basketball in general, uh, super, super excited about this tournament run and really excited for the future because as much as we will all miss Caitlin Clark, uh, there are a lot of Juju Watkins and Paige Beckers. I mean, there's still some big name talent coming up. So it's going to be fun to watch that sport continue to grow. Um, and hopefully we're going to see some of that growth on the campus that you and I both know and love as well. Yeah, that would be really great to see. Don Staley uh, replaced all five starters, by the way, yeah, this year. Yeah, which is insane. And it didn't lose again. went 38 and no, not a, yeah. not a bad way to go about uh, turning over your roster. You're right, though, Melissa, because for everybody outside of, I guess, South Carolina and Iowa as of yesterday and UConn and Purdue on the men's side today, every other basketball team is having that conversation as a staff right now. Yeah. How are we going to improve next year? How are we going to make a deeper run in the tournament next year or get to the conference tournament or just qualify for something? next year every coaching staff across the country is having that conversation including tcu on the men and women's side with jamie dixon's staff and mark campbell's staff we've seen a few portal entries on both of those Mm -hmm. rosters micah peavy is in the transfer portal jacoby coles is in the transfer portal for the men's team and melissa when you look at the roster right now for men's basketball at tcu you've got ernest ude You've got potentially Assam Mustafa. You've got um, Posey, Jace Posey, and you've got Isaiah Manning. Isaiah Manning, yeah. And then you've got the four incoming freshmen. Those are your eight right now. And you've got the CJ Walker graduate transfer from Central Florida. So those are your nine right now, which means you've got four, potentially five if Mustafa doesn't return, um, scholarships to get some veteran leadership find yourself a point guard, find yourself a shooter, find yourself a backup center, find yourself a wing because you need more than one or two. If you include Manning in that, um, things are at an interesting crossroads. I feel from a roster management standpoint for men's basketball. And we knew that this was coming, but now that it's here, especially when you lose PV and Coles in the portal, the situation starts to look pretty dire, more dire than even I was anticipating it being right now, even though we're still pretty early in the off season. Well, I mean, it's, it's like, where are you? Oh gosh, now we're going to absolutely lose his mind. Um, it's just, Hey dude, we're, we're recording, sir, please. Um, so let's see how effective that is. Um, of course it's right as you finish too, so I can't even mute it. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that, my question is a who's the known quantity because we all love the potential of Ernest Ude, but we haven't seen anything that makes him makes us feel like you, he can be a go-to guy next year. And that's your most experienced player. <laughs> that's your yeah. only guy potentially that played any kind of significant minutes this past season. Who is going to mm-hmm. score the basketball? Who's going to dribble the basketball up the court? You know, who is going to be your captain and your leader? I mean, You are talking about completely rebuilding on the fly again, and you've had mixed results doing so, but what you don't have going into next year that you did have this year is a core of guys who had been around the program for two or three years, who knew the system, who had experience playing in big games. Um, You don't have any of that. You don't have Emmanuel Miller. You don't have Micah Peavy. You know, you, you don't have these guys that, that know what it's like to compete in this program and, and know how to do what Jamie Dixon wants to do, even if they didn't always do so this year. They, there was at least a foundation. Your foundation is basically Jace Posey, Isaiah Manning, and Ernest Uday, and one of those guys has played basketball at the collegiate level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, terrifying. 
It's uh, and there are there are definitely moments where younger players step up and play incredibly well. Sure. There's uh, an opportunity for development this off season. Obviously, it's just, we're still just at the very front end of the off season, and there's a long way to go as far as filling out the empty spots on this roster. So this isn't necessarily a sound the alarms. Things are going to go poorly, but I do think it's it, it's fair to recognize that there's going to be a major shift on this roster from the third most experienced team in the country to what it's going to be next year. And if you want to do some paralleling, which is a word that I just made up right now mm -hmm. because I trapped I myself saying. by my sentence structure, mm -hmm. draw some parallel lines between 2022 TCU football and mm -hmm. 2024 TCU men's basketball, where football had a brand new coaching staff, but also the by definition, most experienced team in the country. And what did they do? They won a ton of close games. They executed down the stretch in clutch moments. They made the Big 12 championship, and they made the college football playoff, and they won a game, and they made the national championship. What did we see from this men's basketball team this year as the third most experienced team in the country? A lot of second-half blown leads, a lot of bad execution in, in, in key moments, a quarterfinal loss in the Big 12 tournament, and a one-and-done in the NCAA tournament. And so I, you know, it, it almost feels like this was the year where really the deep run was supposed to happen and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can sit here all night and assign blame wherever we think it should be assigned. I don't think that's productive really, but real, realistically, like this was supposed to be the year you made the run and you didn't make the run. So how do you rebound in a year that's supposed to be a re, re, rebuilding year? And what does 2024 and 25 look like? You know, Dixon just signed his two-year contract extension. He's here through 2930. You know, there's a long runway here for him, and I think that's great and appropriate. But how do, how do we handle this transition in a season of college basketball? Season not just being yeah. one season, but just kind of overarching yes. this now time and Season. place of college yeah. basketball where rebuilding should not take you very long because you have access to the portal. Well, that that's, but that's the difference between 2022 TCU football and 2023, 24 TCU basketball is 2022 TCU football had guys that took their lumps as freshmen and sophomores in that program. That's true. That's true. And, and TCU basketball had to recruit a lot of guys that had played a lot of basketball, but had not played a lot of basketball at TCU. You had that core group. You had Emmanuel Miller, Michael Peavy, Jacoby Coles, uh, Xavier Cork. You you had those guys, just like you had your Max Duggins and your um, Kendra Millers and your Quentin Johnstons and um, you know your Bud Clarks and guys that Avila, had been yeah yeah well yeah 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 Avila. and then you brought in some key pieces. Alana Lee, you know, is is the first one that comes to mind. Um, Johnny Hodges, like some some guys that were going to be really critical role players but had great understanding of the role and were willing to fit in. Basketball is mm. a little bit different because yeah. most guys that are transferring are transferring because they want more minutes, they want more opportunity. And in, in this case, particularly, you had a couple guys like a Jameer Nelson and a Trey Tennyson who were looking potentially for to get on the radar of professional scouts on mm -hmm. some level, right? And so yeah. that's kind of a, I need to get mine. It's harder to get guys that haven't been around to buy into a system. And I'm not saying those guys didn't try, I mean, we saw mm -hmm. we saw a lot of growth in Nelson, especially like of, of trying yes. to play a role and play a role he was not comfortable playing or wasn't you know was not his natural position, um, mm -hmm. and that but that's the thing right. So if you can keep your Jace Posey or Isaiah Manning, your your David Punch, the, these guys coming in, and you can say buy in, take your lumps this year, maybe take a couple next year too. You're looking at a year three of being. You know, I mean, why do we see Oakland and St. Peter uh, and all of these schools make runs because guys stay together and they. That's really, really hard to do in today's world of college basketball, yeah. though. Can, and is. that'll be the test for Jamie Dixon. Can you get these? These he got these guys to buy in and redshirt. Getting mm -hmm. Jace Posey to redshirt is that's a huge, huge step. That's a huge feather in his cap because yes. Jace Posey's not going to go a lot of places in redshirt. Um, mm -hmm. that, that highly touted, but you get that guy to redshirt. You get Manning to redshirt. You get some of these freshmen to buy into small roles next year. And you say, please just trust me and make this a three-year commitment or two-year commitment. And then you probably see some big dividends, but there's no guarantee of that happening. And then how do you find the right pieces to complement them? Like that, that really mm -hmm. becomes the question. And oh, by the way, next year you're adding Arizona. 
Yep. Next year, you're adding a Colorado team that does lose their best player, but was pretty dang good this pretty year. Pretty much their entire roster. Yeah, a lot, I guess Eddie Lampkin did leave as well. But but now you've seen some proof of concept there. Mm-hmm. Maybe we we know if you Colorado as a school can recruit the portal. So um, yep. but, so it'll be interesting to see. But it's not like this league gets worse because Texas and Oklahoma leave. Um, it's only going to no, get no. tougher. It's only going to get deeper. Oklahoma State, I think, made an absolute home run hire. I mean, there's just, it's not going to get any easier to be successful. And so it's going to have to be, what is a fan base do we need to see? And what does TCU Athletics leadership need to see? What is the expectation for this team in 2024, 2025? And, and what do we have to be willing to accept, but still be able to see the forest for the trees, so to speak? For sure. Yeah. And perspective is critically important when you're in a transition period with a program as well. Uh, and I think you did a great job of providing it there. Um, on the women's side, you see Sydney Harris at the portal, mm. Vic Flores at the portal, Ugh. Jade Clack at the portal, Ugh. which was probably, I think, expected with Clack. Yeah. Um, and so now, I mean, you've got uh, Jade Owens gone. Um, you bring in Haley Cavender. So there's your kind of point guard swap. You bring back Madison Connor, you bring back Aaliyah Robinson, Robertson, uh, but really kind of it's a similar situation for Campbell in year two, which is, hey, how are we going to hit the portal in a way that brings us the veteran leadership we need, the skills that we've kind of are, are missing right now? Um, how are we going to put a put a roster together that's competitive and take us a step further than we went this year? Because I think in spite of all of the injuries, I would qualify year one under Mark Campbell as a, as a wild success. Be- because go, of the injuries, we get right? to qualify it as a wild success. I mean, yeah, if you don't have the injuries, this is this is a tournament team. This is a team that probably pushes for the top quarter of the Big 12, not the bottom third. Um, like, uh, what needs to happen now, I guess, to take that step forward beyond just, Hey, let's try and stay healthy. You got it. You got it. I mean, they got a lot of, a lot of people to replace as well. Well, it's so interesting too, because, you know, as you were saying that I was thinking about, it it was like, Oh man, this team would have been so, but, but also this TCU basketball, men's and women's both kind of ran parallel lines through the first two months of the season. TCU women's basketball, I don't want to say got a pass, but Obviously, mm-hmm. their expectations changed dramatically because of the yeah. injuries. Um, you know, who, who knows what that would have looked like. But I think based on the concept, proof of concept that we were allowed to see where Mark Campbell succeeded and, you know, Jamie Dixon did not, is the women he brought in from the portal seemed to buy in and understand their roles and be willing to play those roles much earlier and more effectively, but they didn't have to go through the grind of a big 12 season together to have to prove that. Right. So, yeah. so we don't know, but, but by everything that we saw, it sure did look like he understand, understood how to recruit the portal that he brought in great players. There's not a lot of freshmen. And I don't think there's a big, I think there's only like one or two incoming freshmen in this signing class who like, it's a very small group. And so, um, you know, that's going to be, does he consistently try to build with the portal or what's ultimately mm-hmm. his grand plan? And I know you've got oh, to sit down. You're talking about the high school class. Yes, they don't have yeah. any high school side. They're high school not. Signed. Okay. No, okay. he, not. and I, I asked him about this around signing day in the fall as well, because, um, I said, Hey, I know that you, you got here in like February and that's not a lot of time. And so what he said was, you know, we understand that as a new staff, it's almost impossible to get into high schools right now and yeah. convince a senior mm-hmm. on a new relationship to come through the front door of our building and be a part of this program. So what he did, and we'll see if this works out or not. It makes sense in my brain when he explained it to me. He said his staff, from they were. it's like it's portal and it's juniors in high school. Mm. And we're just going to start cultivating those relationships with juniors. And we're going to start to establish ourselves with the class of 2025. Mm. And we're going to try and hit the ground running with the transfer portal and then bring in a class in 2025 um, out of high school. I'm like, okay, I mean, I understand the relationship aspect of recruiting and the shortened yeah. timeline and all of that makes sense in my head. We'll see how it works out in practice. It's that theory versus practice bit again, yeah. 
I, I would love to see we'll one see. or two, yeah, coming in yeah. this year, something yeah. to build on. But I also understand why there's not. You know, I I think it does make sense. Um, you know, in theory. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see. He's got a lot of holes to fill. Uh, Sydney Harris I, was the one that really I think surprised me, and I don't know if that should have been a surprise to me. Um, but but that was one where I was like, man, like when we saw her healthy. Like you saw <sighs> something there, like there was a lot of potential. Um, but I also imagine that there've been a lot of conversations and there's a master plan there. And, um, you know, I, I think, and I hate to say this, I'm loath to say this because the death of the Pac-12 makes me sad, but uh, you look at how good Oregon State was, you know, you look at some of the, the players in that conference, there's going to be a lot of movement coming out of, of that. And, and they'll mm-hmm. and, you know, Mark Campbell knows that conference well. Um, so I, I, I don't worry about them being able to kind of rebound next year, especially with what he does bring back. Um, but I think it'll be the same thing. You're going to have to lower your expectations a little bit because, you know, having Jade Owens and Sedona Prince alongside Madison Con- Connor, I mean, that was your, this team could have made a run for sure, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just never got that opportunity. So uh, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Um, there's a bigger spotlight on women's basketball than we've seen in any time in recent history, and I, I want that spotlight to to shine on Fort Worth. Um, but they're going to have to win, and they're going to have to have some personalities. And oh, by the way, pretty big personality coming in, as you already mentioned. Um, Haley Cavender will have people paying attention to TCU women's basketball. The question will be: Can Mark Campbell and his staff make that attention mean something more than just the the celebrity? of their point yeah. guard. I mean, the reality is, is that Haley Cavender is a point guard. She's a hooper. I mean, She's if anybody player. like it be, and I think I wrote about this in the fall in my first kind of sit down with Campbell was you got a lot of folks on the roster or incoming on the roster. Now my dogs are barking. Your top, it's, yeah, it's, your turn, yeah. There's a storm rolling in. We had the eclipse yeah. today. We had, we had full coverage today of the eclipse, and now we've got like thunderstorms and hail for the next three days. So Texas. Thank you for Texas weather. Appreciate it. God, thank you. Um, but you have not only Haley Cavender, who's got this massive social following, and and you've got Sedona Prince, who's got a massive following. She had, she had a massive following this year. You had Jay Nowens, who had a huge following this year. You had... Um, you know, Aaliyah Robertson, who is a local product who everybody paid a lot of attention yeah. to. But the reality is, is that I think a lot of folks stop at that kind of front door, front window of social media. Yeah. And they think, oh, this person, this is who this person is. When in reality, like you don't see, nobody saw how hard Sedona Prince worked to get yeah. back from that finger injury this year. Every time we had a media availability with Jamie Dixon, she was in there shooting free throws or getting drilled work done or one-on-one work with the coach to work her way back. She didn't post any of that on socials. Yeah. Right. We, we, we've seen a little bit of Haley Cavender on socials posting about like shooting hoops with her sister and doing some other stuff, but she does most of her work in the background behind the scenes. And I think that it's going to be a really cool opportunity for her and for the rest of TCU women's basketball next year to, provide a deeper look into kind of the full personhood of some of these young women is to say, Oh yeah, we know her as like the social media star and the girl who she and her twin did some stuff with WWE and with better with, you know, Jake Paul and whoever else, but she's a basketball player. I mean, yeah. she, she was the leading scorer and leading assist person on a Miami team that made an elite eight run. Yeah. Like she's a hooper. Right. And so I think TCU fans are going to be really excited to see a Hooper get in the building and win some basketball games with this team. And then also just kind of welcome all of Haley Cavender and into the mix as well. I think it's going to be super cool. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. Um, You know what else is super cool? What's super cool? Back when I was, when TCU baseball was winning series, um, (laughs) I, uh, 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 our our friends at Hell's Half Acre were very, very busy producing sweet merch. Um, I happened to be wearing one of them tonight. Um, We are so thankful to our sponsors. We're thankful to Dave Campbell's Texas Football, of course. um, And we're very, very thankful to the good folks at Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods. Uh, You've got the hat. 
I'm rocking the shirt. They also, like, I think in light of uh, the struggles, there have been some great sales going on with Alice Half Acre. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, really so, truly. yeah, if, if you keep your eyes peeled through their website, there's lots of great opportunity. But t shirts, uh, like you said, the rope hat, which is great, sweatshirts, quarter zips. I mean, they have the whole thing game day gear, uh, koozies, everything. Um, they do an awesome job. And so much of what they do is about giving back to TCU student athletes. So, mm -hmm. whether it's using NIL deals, giving a portion of the proceeds, um, that our friends at Hell's Half Acre um, are doing really incredible things, super creative, awesome, awesome looking merch, um, and then and then doing really great things with with the success that they're having with their business. And um, kind enough to help sponsor us here on the Frogs Insider podcast. Um, as Jamie always says, if you do make a purchase because you heard about us, heard about them from us, and you go check out their website in that little comment box, let them know that, that you heard about it on the Frogs Insider podcast. Um, but we love supporting people that support TCU. We love supporting local businesses in Hell's Half Acre. Um, is both of those things and more so um, check them out uh, hell's half acre sg.com uh, is the website uh, great social media presence as well and like you, you can always see them uh, hanging around TC sporting events supporting the frogs um, so please go support people that help support us preach you know who else I love following on social media Melissa that's the TCU football account this time of year Oof, you know yes. what they're posting Spring football All content, of the spring baby. football content. And it's so much fun. They just had an open practice on Friday night. I know that a lot of folks were out there watching that thing live. I was not because I was watching TCU baseball happen in Cincinnati. Um, I was keeping up uh, with all of Jeremy Clark's updates on Horn Frog yeah. Bliss, though. I will say that. Um, As no, have one I does it, no one covers football quite like JC. Um, <clears throat> shameless plug. But... Yeah. Look, spring football is back, and I think it's important to, A, allow people to get excited because yeah. there's so much that goes into dissecting a season, dissecting a position group, or talking about how teams are going to improve, or which coach is on the hot seat, or you know, all of the extracurricular stuff that comes with just following along with college football. I like the spring because, in reality, just – Every fan base is excited. Every fan base has a reason to be hopeful. Every fan base has a reason to look forward to the fall in some capacity. And with TCU fans, that is exactly how it is right now and exactly how it should operate. That's part A. Part B is it's, it's 14 practices in a spring game. Yeah, We're not going to be able to learn everything we want to learn about this team right now, especially when you consider the fact that Josh Hoover is not practicing yeah. at all. And that the football, that one half of the football on the defensive side is still doing install. Mm -hmm. Right. And so everything that we can try and glean or try to dissect about the spring football season, my take on it, even though I, I do create content around it a little bit is let's just enjoy it. Yeah. Let's let's just, you know, Ken Seals was out there on Friday night slinging it. That's dope. That's right. awesome. Drake Dabney looked great. There was some Clark on Clark Haiti, crime can out really there. Book. Oh, my gosh. Haas was zooming. He's been zooming all spring, yeah. right? Guys should be going and getting fitted for a, a tuxedo for the prom. And he's out there zipping around, dusting people, really, truly, with his legs. Like, he is so fast. It, but that's that's the level of conversation I think we should be having. Oh, my gosh. It's pretty cool. Andy Avalos rolled out a dime a 416 yeah. dime the other day like that's pretty dope i'd love to see that in a real game in the fall wonder how that will work out that like we don't need to get into oh my gosh cam smith the memphis transfer like he looks great they're really really high on him man he's got to get like 100 tackles and five picks next year that's no, the, no idea. Just, come on let's get it you know oh my gosh these two guys are they ran with the ones at cornerback today oh what does that mean? What about this other guy that was supposed to run with the ones? Well, he probably will tomorrow. <laughs> you know, yeah, Imani I, Bailey, right? In the spring two years ago, everyone was like, why is Imani Bailey getting snaps? Kendra Miller should be getting those snaps. What's going on? Amari Di Mercado, why is he in on third downs? What are we doing? It, it's just the only time of year that Enjoy you get to watch. Enjoy it and just let them work. Yeah. It's the only time you get to watch your guys play and not have to think about the fact that that you're anything but undefeated, right? Like even yeah. in the fall, it's too it's too close to real. But yeah, you're just. I think it's fine to mm -hmm. enjoy. I, now again, I've I've been burned too many times. I'm not going to watch a spring football and be like, 
Oh, I think we're going to be 12 and 0 this year. No, we've learned, <laughs> we we both learned that lesson last year, Big right? Big time last year. Yes. Um, so, but yeah, but you just say, "Hey, there's there's some cool stuff happening on the defensive side of the ball. We've heard the word pressure more in the last couple mm-hmm. weeks than we heard in the last two years. Um, yes. You know, I, I think that that if nothing else, you feel like, hey, there's a couple guys in, in the quarterback room that, you know, we don't know Josh Hoover's injury situation, his health situation yet. They've been pretty hush-hush on that. Mm-hmm. But but we got guys that le- look at least competent. Right. Yes. It's it's fun to get excited about Haas. And I still hope that I do not see him in a meaningful situation for more than a package or two a game this whole year. Like, I hope mm-hmm. we don't get to that point, but I, it's still excited to be there. But ooh, there could be some fun packages for this kid. Kendall, Kendall Bras could have some fun with him. Um, but other than that, yeah, like just she said, just watch and enjoy and be excited that football is happening at TCU and that everybody's a winner right now. And mm-hmm. uh, I think other than, like you said, paying attention to some of the stuff that Avalos is doing and some of the things that are going to look a lot different, that I think where you can actually start to glean a little bit of knowledge and information going forward. Yeah. For the most part, just just enjoy. Just, just be football. happy, be it's excited. Football in it's March football. and April. It's like, football. And that's pretty great. Yeah. It is football. And those were, those they were put pads on. Quotes. They hit each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now you're right. Fall camp, too, is a totally different beast. That's when you mm-hmm. should say, it's interesting that this guy's getting most of the first team snaps. And I think we said that at times about uh, some of the things that we saw along the offensive and defensive lines last fall. Yeah. Uh, fall yeah, camp as well. Sure. It's like, it's interesting that this is the order of events that's happening right now. And then they rolled out there and, you know, for the first four games, Brandon Coleman was a guard, not a tackle. And, you know, so there are some things that you can glean from fall camp that I think will translate into the season and, and that should be paid attention to. But, but yeah, in spring, in spring ball, I'm just happy that I get to season football and have, yeah, have a lighthearted conversation about it. It's delightful. It is delightful, just like our friends over at Homefield Apparel, well Melissa. Done. Homefield Apparel, uh, gosh, it's it's like 80s right now in Texas. It dropped down into the 70s for the brief minute and a half that we had our solar eclipse today. Um, so it's not quite hoodie weather anymore, but I still occasionally do rock the Homefield Apparel hoodie around my house. Um, I'm rocking the Homefield Apparel shirt right now because it is comfortable and a little bit warmer than normal. Um, homefieldapparel.com frogs and 15 is the code for 15% off of your first purchase and 10% off of all subsequent purchases. That's frogs. I N one five, get over there, homefield apparel, use the code, uh, and get yourself some excellent TCU swag because it's incredibly comfortable and it looks great. The end. That is my pitch. And seeing a couple of big 10 teams playing the national championship game, man, I, the amount of bomber jackets and home field shirts and sweatshirts I saw in the crowds, very, very high. So mm-hmm. be a lemming, wear home field, the end. I just, I had to process for a second that like make the connection there and understand that yes, Washington is in fact going to be in the big 10. So no, I was talking about basketball and talking about Iowa and Purdue, but that's also, I, yeah. Oh yes. Not, yeah. So, so really in all sports. Um, and I just, time. you know, I, Though the home field has schools spanning the the uh, United States, um, I still think of them as a little Midwestern Indiana brand. So they well, they are a little Midwestern they Indiana are. brand. They're just primed for a global takeover. They are. Um, you know who's not primed for a global takeover? Oh, okay. I, and, right. and listen, we saved this. Like, look, Jamie and I's conversation yesterday about what we were going to talk about on the podcast when we were going to record. Uh, guys, I just like if you are not following Jamie for baseball, if you're not reading his articles on 247, if you are not interacting with him in the game thread, for this man's sanity, please go do so. Um, <laughs> if you don't want to make the financial commitment to Horn Frog Blitz, like, that's fine. But please subscribe for maybe, like, the next two months just so that he isn't screaming into the void. Um, and maybe even go say some nice things. Not Because no one's being mean to Jamie, but the negativity, like, it's rough, guys. It is, And, and I will say that, like, I hate read a lot of it because I feel so badly about the way things are going on the baseball diamond that I just got to kind of commiserate with people. Uh, yeah. Jamie, I, I think I texted in the group Saturday or Sunday and was just kind of like, like, is this, like, is this the point where we just kind of throw in the towel? Because we know, we know, we keep saying, remember last year, remember last year, this is worse. The record is mm-hmm. worse. The way they're losing is worse. The, there's there has not been a lot of bright spots. You talked about rock bottom in your Monday morning manager. I read it this morning. It was great. Um, I I I don't I don't want to say this team can't pull it together. You've said a million times there this is, team is too talented to be playing this badly. But also like I don't know what can turn things around at this point in the season with their remaining schedule. 
so it's it's april um what is it what is today april 8th at the time of recording okay. this do you remember and i drew some parallels between this mm-hmm. this weekend at cincinnati where the frogs got swept run ruled on sunday to last year's weekend at west virginia where they lost the first two games and then got run ruled on sunday it's april 8th that was the fifth sixth and seventh was that cincinnati series that we just experienced do you remember the weekend that west virginia happened last year yes yeah it was terrible yeah yeah no but the, it was, the dates it was, do you remember was, the it, dates? was it this weekend it was the last weekend in april oh mm-hmm. it was really? three weeks ahead of where we are currently in this baseball baseball season okay it was the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, I believe. Now, you're right. The record is worse than it was last year. This is a bigger hole to climb out of. They don't have a Braden Taylor or an Eli Nunez or a Trey Richardson or an Austin Davis to save them. They don't even maybe have a Sam Stoutenborough to step up in the back mm-hmm. half of the season like they did last year. Um, and and they are also very much staring down the barrel of two weekends, the next two weekends that could fully bury them with Texas Tech coming to town and then a road weekend at Texas. Mm-hmm. Like there, there is no way to polish what we have seen from TCU baseball over the last really six weeks of the season to make it sound like, oh, hey, I know for sure that everything's going to be okay because I don't. Uh, this team is not played up to its ability. They aren't hitting right now at all. Not yeah, consistently. All. They had they had two really good games against Houston, but they scored two runs each in these three losses against Cincinnati. There's some starting pitching issues that are still very apparent. I and and I don't even include Peyton Tolley's Friday night start in that because he gave you five and two thirds. He only allowed four runs. He struck out six. The command wasn't quite where it was the last two weeks. But in my opinion, if a starter in college baseball gives you five and two thirds against a team that's got a sub 500 record in your conference and a team that's got a, a an ERA as a pitching staff of almost six and a half, going five and two thirds and, and four runs should have been plenty mm-hmm. for TCU to take a hold of that baseball game and come away with at least one win. Louis Rodriguez had a bad start Mm -hmm. on Saturday, gave up six runs and two innings. That was tough coming off of a great performance the week before. The reality is, is that Cincinnati did all of their damage in the early innings. They scored 14 runs between the first and second innings on Saturday and Sunday, and then just held the lead after that. They just kind of held on and TCU couldn't, couldn't climb out of the hole, even though the bullpen looked pretty good on Friday and Saturday, the bullpen gave you seven and a third scoreless innings combined. Uh, Cademan Parker looked really good. Mason Bixby looked awesome. Um, and yet they got behind three to one on Sunday. And the, I think general feeling was, I don't know if they can climb out of this hole. Yeah. And it was a two run hole. Two, yeah, and then, two it, runs and then it became, is... it became a seven run hole and then it became an eight run hole and then it became a run rule. And so, you know, things kind of just spiraled out of control after that. But the reality was, is that it was four to two on Friday and you weren't sure if they were going to be able to come back, it was six to two on Saturday and you didn't feel great about it at all. And then all of a sudden things got out of hand on, on Sunday. I I, I think that there are still signs of this being a ball club that could break out of it, that could snap out of it. Peyton totally hitting a double the other day. You have Sam Myers who went six for 11 on the weekend, swung the bat really well after not getting consistent playing time over the last 10 days, 12 days or so um he went six for 11 and didn't score a run by the way right like they're not stringing together hits like they should they're not getting on base by hitting the baseball like they should the pitching has been too inconsistent and if they don't figure out a way to fix that like i wrote today if the big 12 tournament started tomorrow they wouldn't have got they would not have gotten an invite to to arlington because only the top 10 teams in the conference go they're sitting 12th in the conference this team is too talented to be playing baseball at this level. And yet they've done it for the last five weeks outside of the Houston series, which they swept somewhere between what we saw that weekend against Houston and what we saw this past weekend against Cincinnati, that somewhere between those two instances is where real TCU baseball is. And I'm just, I'm while 
the road is, uh, as Kirk Sarlos likes to say, everything we want to achieve is still out ahead of us. And that is true at this point in the year. There's got to be a growing sense of urgency that, hey, everything's out in front of us. There's still road left, but we're running out of road. And the road doesn't get easier from here because you've got Texas Tech, you've got Texas, you've got a Kansas State team that's hitting its stride. You've got a Baylor team that looks better than everybody thought it would be and is currently ahead of you in this conference standings. A Baylor team that took two of three from that Cincinnati team that just swept you, right? Like there, the potential is still there, but there needs to be a different sense of urgency moving forward. And I think there will be, right? I mean... We're not going to see them play on Tuesday or Wednesday this week because of the weather forecast in Fort Worth. They basically called UT Rio Grande and said, do you want to come up here and risk the rain delays and had a conversation and kind of mutually decided to to cancel those two games? So you've got a week to sort it out and put a better product on the field. I I, I don't know that there's a singular solution to it at this point. I know that the talent is there. I know that the coaches are capable. Those are the two facts that I'm standing firm on. What the end product ends up looking like from here on out, though, I truly have no idea. Well, and I I think that will be the question because something that's different this year than a year ago is this conference is not nearly as strong. True. And you're losing to teams that are not, you're losing series to teams that are not postseason teams pretty consistently. Um, you know, I think the talent is there, but also what is talent without production? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, the road is getting short. Um, and at some point this talent has to produce. And I think we've seen a lot of questions rise up among the fan base of if the talent isn't producing, but we've seen the talent produce before, what's the disconnect there? What's different? What's happening? And and that we don't know the answer to because we're not in the locker rooms and we're not in the Mm -hmm. dugout. We're not in all of those places. Um, I, I mean, like it's not too late. Kirk Starless is right. Everything that they want is still ahead of them, but it's getting real late, real early. Sun's getting real low, big guy. Yeah. Yeah. That that moon is passing through. (laughs) Look, and, and I will say this too, because I, and I think I tried to take the approach on the podcast during the fall when we talked about baseball and in the preseason leading up to baseball of not doing what we both did for the football yeah. team last year of saying, Listen, oh my I God, said seven talent. and five, eight and four initially. I, you talked you to did. me into, you talked I me into excitement. I, yeah. yeah, that's fine. It's my fault. Cause you blame were out Jamie. there. Yeah. I'm a blame Hashtag Jamie. Blame Jamie. Um, but look, I sat there all fall and watched this yeah. team. And similar to what I just said about spring football, there's only so much you can glean from inner squad, but this team, this team is a better hitting team than what we, what we've seen on the field the last month. I, I, I stake my credibility on that. They are a better hitting team. They are a better pitching team than we've seen them be consistently this year. And at some point you either figure it out or you don't. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to see which way this team goes over the next three, four weeks. And, and that'll be what it is. You know, I'm, I, I posted it in the thread on Sunday. I said, y'all go enjoy your Sunday. <laughs> you, you can read the recap after I'm, I'm right. I like, I'm here. And I know that there are a lot of TCU fans that are sticking it out with this team. Yeah. Um, I'm still watching. And I think you should stick it out with this team. But uh, look, sometimes, sometimes teams don't reach the expectations that the fan base has for them. But whenever that happens, I think it's important for people to realize too, if they're missing your expectations, then they've missed theirs by even more. Sure. And I know, I know the expectations that this team had for itself. I know that the expectations some of these players had for themselves and these coaches had for themselves and nobody's, nobody's happy about where they are at 20 and 11 and five and 10 in the big 12. Nobody's happy about that. And I, I mean, there's some pretty damn smart people in that room who are trying to figure it out. So we'll see, right? Like that's, that's all we can do at this point is just say, we'll see if they figure it out, they figure it out and it'll be pretty cool if they do. The thing that sucks is I think for so many years when we've had a gut punch of a football season and then a gut punch of a basketball season, almost every time TCU baseball pulled us out of the mire 
they have not pulled us out of the mire as a fan base yet this year, and that mm-hmm. is rough. Um, we need to be paying, and, and then even tennis is dealing with injury issues. So yep. like, tennis is is struggled a little bit because they've been missing some guys. So it has been a rough athletics year for the TCU fan base. Um, mm-hmm. Baseball could still turn that around on a dime. I mean, we've seen this. Uh, th- this team can get hot for six weeks for sure. That's not out yep. of the question whatsoever. Uh, but it also, this might just be one of those years. And I think that we've got to put all of our good karma in the bank for the future and yep. hope that uh, 2024, 2025 brings us something different if we don't get a quick turnaround here in 2024 mm-hmm. um, and, and hope that something good happens. But I, I will say, as, as easy as it is to get frustrated with Sonny Dykes after that football season and Jamie Dixon after that basketball season and now Kirk Charlos in the middle of this baseball season, every single one of those coaches has proven that they can do great things on yeah. their respective fields. Mm-hmm. Um, and one bad season doesn't have to define. You also don't want to have to count on a team getting hot and making a run, uh, which, sure. which, which I think all three of those coaches have benefited from. Um, mm-hmm. In recent years, uh, you, you'd like to see some consistency. And I think that was kind of our, our struggle at the end of, of Gary Patterson's time in football, especially is where's the consistency. But then Jamie Dix has been pretty damn consistent. And we're like, this is not good enough. So <laughs> basically what we're saying is we are acting like a big time athletic school. Um, and ultimately, that's where we all wanted to be. So congratulations to us. Welcome to being unhappy all of the time <laughs> with your sports. Look, I don't know. I, I like it. I like the conversation. I like the discussion. Sure. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to have every team win every game, but that's not real life because other teams are trying just as hard as you are. Um, there was something, oh, you mentioned injuries with tennis and I did want to do just like a quick injury bug update because the re- TCU baseball is dealing with a mounting number of injuries. Hmm. Kyle Ayers out for the year Such with a the bummer. elbow injury. We still don't have a timeline for Brody Green's return from his hip and groin stuff. I don't know if he's going to be back. I just don't at this point. Hunter Hodges dealing with an oblique. If you've ever tried to lift your arm above your head with the strained oblique, sucks. It's tough. Now imagine trying to throw a baseball. Probably probably not great. Doesn't feel good. You've got Peyton Chatagnier, Hammy, timeline TBD. Uh... Logan Maxwell. Logan Maxwell pulled up lame on Tuesday, was replaced, played Friday, gutted it out, was not running at 100% in the ninth inning. Yeah. That much was very clear. Yeah. Uh, and then missed Saturday and Sunday. Curtis Byrne also missed Saturday and Sunday. Um, we didn't see Micah Kendrick at all this weekend. You know, there uh, are mounting injuries on this team that – I think are part of the inconsistency we're seeing simply because baseball players are creatures of habit. I think more so than almost any other athlete. For sure. um, and TCU has had over 25 different lineups in the first 31 games of the season. Some of that is tinkering, trying to find the right match, the right combination of guys at the right spots in the order. Some of that is also, we don't know how long this guy's going to be out. Yeah. Now we've got to find a body. Hey, this guy just got hurt. Now we've got to switch this up. The DH spot hasn't been hitting like we need. Let's see if this guy can do it, right? There's a lot of, of different things kind of that go in to a situation like that. But when there's that much inconsistency, whether it's because of injury or production or something else, that's going to make life a little bit more challenging for everybody involved as well. And so not only do I hope that they find a little bit more consistency just in their gameplay, I think if they find a little bit more consistency just in the lineup, because either guys are staying healthy or coming back or whatever it might be starting to produce, I think that could go a long way to, to saving the season as well as just finding a little bit more lineup consistency way easier to say than to do. Yeah. Um, uh- all this to say and, is that and, human yeah. performance center needs to get open because yeah, the thank God that's fully funded. Holy solve cow! All of these problems. Put everybody in the purple snow room immediately. Yep. Immediately. immediately, just build that first. Get everybody in there. Oh, Melissa. Uh, Jamie, I think I think this is all. I think we got to get off of this podcast so that we can go watch the second half of this outstanding game and these two giant yes. human beings battle in the paint for twenty more minutes. Fourteen plus feet of human. Just duking it out in the paint. Pretty dope. Crazy. This has been the Frogs Insider Podcast. Uh, She is Melissa Trebowasser. I am Jamie Plunkett. We will be back next week talking about TCU versus Texas Tech. 
Maybe there will have been some more basketball news by then as well. And there's going to be another week of spring football to talk about and not overanalyze, but talk about just a little bit. Uh, so we will get to all of that. A big thanks to Dave Campbell's Texas Football, to Home Field Apparel, and Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods for working with us. And we will talk to you next time. Go Frogs. Go Frogs.